so you have been a student of design and you are very passionate about design i know many professionals who are good at what they do but they have miserably failed when they come into business as an entrepreneur being a professional a very creative person having an international experience of working in your young days uh, in the united states of america in detroit which is considered the heaven for automobile and the mecca of industry for the automobile sector uh, after working for general motors in the design section you plan to come back to india you start your accessories business which you successfully run it for 10 years there you understands the customers moods the thoughts the taste their needs the budgets and then you think of venturing into the design sector of automobiles what was your thought process during this journey from being a student to a employee to a automobile uh, accessories dealer to an entrepreneur okay so i think it starts uh, with the basic tenet of your passion and uh, i guess um, you know looking back uh, one has to have obsessive passion to really <clears throat> do something that he enjoys every day of his life and so for my story was that like most uh, youngsters who go on to get educated in the west because there was no such course in india uh, forget such a course but there was no there were no job opportunities as well i'm talking of the late 70s where the automotive industry really was only the fiats and ambassadors and there was no incentive in, there was no incentive to really put new cars on the road in fact uh, the government did not allow any new car manufacturing uh, to happen uh, i don't know if some of you know but there was a penalty even if you produce one car more than you were licensed and the license capacity was 35000 so it was from that era that one went abroad and stayed stay you know he, you you actually took up a job in one of the um, great brands general motors for and so i worked with general motors but ha having gotten there i realized that you know i will not be able to design a car and that's the sole reason why i went for that course till i attained seniority 25 30 years into the job and i and i guess i wasn't willing to wait that long and i wasn't willing to give 30 years of my life in building general motors brand equity i think <laughs> coming coming from an entrepreneurial family i thought let me go back and be the master of all that i survey and that's how i started the accessory business because that's the closest i could get to cars uh, because in the late 70s if some if i went to my parents or if i went to my bank and said i want to be designing cars they would think i'm i'm a lunatic so you are not an entrepreneur you are a passion pruner who brought the skills to the table and uh, came out with a very successful organization no but but my my sense what i was trying to say that was that when you are obsessively passionate you want to practice your craft each day so you build uh, 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 you i have had to build a company to actually uh, uh, you know practice my craft because if i did sketches who would i go to build there was no one. and therefore i i realized that i just don't want to do anything else in my life other than design cars of what i was passionate about also what i was educated in when you look back uh, mr dilip when you look back is it a good point that there is no competition to you or would that be a bigger growth to you if there would have been competition because in the uh, in the sector of automobile design when if i want a fashion designer i want a dress designer or if i if i want a interior decorator or an exterior architect or whatever there are so many of them available when you talk about a car design only one name appears all the time that is dilip chabria so the lack of competition is it good or bad it's both i think if there was competition uh, the market size would have been bigger but honestly saying it's a great thing because you know i i, I realize when i meet some of my associates and they are in such a competitive scenario uh, it's almost impossible Uh, to make uh, money or it's impossible to have such a high standard of living i mean it's it's a good thing because no customer of mine can actually ever come up and say oh somebody is offering us x price this or x minus this um, so we have that uh, elasticity of pricing 
Um, uh, because of that, we have been able to price ourselves out of certain sectors and go up the value chain, uh, maybe more yield per square foot, more yield per employee. And because of no competition, because our spreads are very high, we are able to plow back a lot back into R&D, which actually feeds back into a brand equity. Fantastic. Since 1993 that you started this business, you have grown to 600 people team yeah. and you have got more than 700 designs to your credit. More yeah. than 700 yeah. designs to your credit. So this journey since 1993 till date, sure. becoming, making your passion into a business model, what were the major elements for your success? Because uh, when the professional gets into an entrepreneurship, he either fails on finance management or he fails on the sales part or he fails on the uh, HR part. Some element he fails and he again gets into the job model or a partnership where he is almost like a working partner. So what was it with you in this journey since 1993? I think again it stems from the fact that you are obsessively passionate and you want to practice your craft. And the first uh, you know, thrust of success, you become captive to the organization because your needs are more than the organizational needs. Why? Because you want to live that life. And therefore, you assume a lot of humility. And, and a lot of people are actually surprised at my humility and they think it's a put-on. But it's not a put-on because it's a beast that you create and you've got to feed it. But in, in that sense, I think because you endear yourself to your employees, to your stakeholders, to your customers, um, I mean, a case in point, you guys have been following us up, I'm here. Would you have actually imagined the perception that I have? Do you think it was easy for you to get me here? No. So that's the perception which is okay for, from that point of view, but why the organization worked and ticked? Because each one felt they were doing a great job. They were being led by a benevolent uh, leadership, not by a despotic, idiosyncratic, creative entrepreneur. So, you know, all those things put together, I think makes the organization tick. So, parents give birth to film stars and other stars. Yeah. You gave birth to a hero car yeah. and there was a film made on it. Yeah, that's Who right. gave you that idea? Was it branding? No, no, no. I mean, many a times uh, after the film was released, you know, it was a box office failure. But it was the number one grossing film every single year on television. Even, beat, even beating three years, it's the number one grossing film. So um, uh, the producers rang me up after the first year and he said, you know, we have a major problem and people, uh, people are asking me, how much did DC pay you? And whereas it was the reverse. They paid us a lot of money because we built three cars for them. So it was as simply that they wanted to really leverage our name and our design ability and all that. So, uh, I mean, it's done wonders for us because uh, uh, of course, uh, some of our cars have been featured in earlier films, Yash Chopra's films and, and uh, quite, quite, a, quite a few of, of Bollywood films. But I'm really amazed at the reach of Bollywood. I'm amazed. I mean, like you mentioned, I, I go to all these Ivy, Ivy League institutions across the world and they talk about, these, about this uh, film. So I'm really amazed at the reach. You get customers who are the high and the mighty and the powerful. How do you manage them? They, they are ready to spend a lot, but they are very demanding. So, how do you handle the customers? There are good ones also, there are bad ones also. There is good money also, there is bad money also. You make the, them the luxury, one BHKs and the two BHKs on four wheels. How do you handle their pressure points as yeah, an entrepreneur? No, I mean, it's uh, commonly said that, you know, if you can't afford a house, you go to DC because it's even more than a house. But that's not… Uh, but having said that, I mean, yeah, because when we do some of these projects is, uh, you know, one, one and a half lakh rupees a square foot is our actually conversion rate. Uh, and we were trying to get into home interiors and we realized what a shitty business it was because nobody was willing to pay even 10,000 rupees a square foot. I said, forget it, you know, you don't mean that kind of business. But having said that, I think all people who come to us, our customers, are very well informed. So they are very serious people. It's serious money, so they're well researched. You get uh, sometimes uh, arrogant people, we have to put up with them. I don't interact personally with them, and, but, but you do get uh, issues uh, when you're dealing with some, some politicians. I don't know if you know, but about three, four months back, there was an FIR, uh, there was an FIR filed by Raja Bhaiya, 
because we did not deliver his vehicle. His vehicle has been lying ready in my Delhi operation for the last seven months. There was a 21 lakh outstanding. He told me, clear the money and take the vehicle. He being he, he realized that, you know, he can put on the screws and make us he dance. He must have felt very odd because what gets against him is doing it against somebody else. Yeah, so, so, so you get, so that's probably part of business hazards of trade. Whenever you talk about personalization uh, in any business, it is a service sector. You are in yes. a service sector. Yes. Whenever we talk about personalization, every customer who's paying big money also has got high levels of satisfaction. Yeah. So you must be definitely encountering a lot of this kind of feedbacks after the product is delivered that the satisfaction level is not there. How have you trained your employees to manage such situations? Because our entrepreneurs, some of us who are in the service sector also, this is a major uh, department to deal with customer satisfaction. How do you do that in your enterprise? So we used to have these issues in the uh, earlier years of operation because we really, really did not know how to, how to handle this uh, aspect. Uh, but we've, we've learned how to manage those expectations. And I think you have to be honest to your, to your trade. If, if the product is not so good, you might as well be honest and say, you know, product is not so good. Give me some more time. Let me correct it. Or if it's, if it's not good, just for the sake of not good, then you have to challenge it. But most of the time, we really don't have 99.99%. You don't have a problem because at the end of the day, I think if you're, if you're doing a good job, it shows. You're one of the first people in India who converted designs into a product on automobiles. Like a design which was being done for one car, you customized it and you started mass producing it for right. vehicles like Innovas and the Fortuners right. and all other vehicles. So, how do you get these ideas for expansion? How do you convert your limitations into your strengths? Uh, do you have a core think tank? Do you have advisors on board? Or is it your own thoughts? How do you derive at that? No, it's a, it's a culmination of the marketing feedback that we get and the inquiry base that we have across offices. And so, we cull them, collate them, we really understand what's happening. But the underlying essence of our uh, place under the sun is that we do what a manufacturer will not do or cannot do, either because of skill or because of scale. And we, f we fit in that slot uh, because, you know, manufacturers are geared to do much larger volumes. Uh, you know, they need 100,000 units. And uh, we, we would come somewhere where even 2,000 units, 3,000 units are good enough and therefore they would not uh, be interested. We already have built that brand equity to end customer, so he is able to, uh, you know, have the confidence that we're going to deliver to him. So it all actually fits into, basically it's a sum total of market positioning, presaging the future, and uh, collecting the marketing feedback that you've had. And with the line of business that you are into, how do you see uh, expanding your marketplace? How do you do that? Do you do only advertising? It is referral marketing? Or how do you penetrate the market within the India, within the country? And how could you reach out to the other parts of the world, especially Europe, where your designs have been implemented by the sure. uh, automotive uh, majors? Yeah. How do you plan to do that? How do you do that exactly? How would you convince a European brand to get you on board for getting their designs done? Because it's always a bias there on whom you get the work done from, especially the designs which, for which the companies are known for. Yeah, so at this point of time, uh, we are not looking at Europe from the customizing point of view. Uh, OEM point of view. Uh, we are not looking at that from an OEM point of view because we believe that India is such a huge market by itself. We haven't even seeded India in that sense. But, uh, I, 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 you know, you might know or some of you uh, uh, guests might know that we also now car manufacturers. We have the sports car which we have launched one and a half year back. So for that, we are looking at should I have the courage to ask the price point? It's uh, 36 lakhs 93,000. We are very oh, successful. that's all? Yeah. And you can have a look at the, look at, look at it on the net. It's called the Avanti. Uh, we are looking at that product to be exported to Europe. Uh, there are a lot of regulatory issues that we may have to overcome. But somewhere two, three years down the line, uh, that's a distinct possibility. Mm -hmm.